All right, so today we're going to look at uh, two sections. Okay, the first one we're not going to spend very long on, but it's solving systems graphically. And when you want to solve systems graphically, doing it by hand isn't the best way, but if you have a calculator that can graph it for you, then that's okay, because you can get a pretty precise answer. When you graph two equations, when you want to solve them on the calculator, what are you going to be looking for? with the two equations. You're going to look for where they do one, where they intersect. So remember, a system of equations is just when you're solving for more than one variable, you're solving for two. So when you write an answer to a system, you have to tell me two numbers, an x value and a y value. If you get one right and get the other one wrong, you get half credit. But you, to get full credit, you have to give me the correct x value and the correct y value. What you're basically giving me for an answer is a coordinate. That's the answer. It's a coordinate. It's the point where they cross. So if we're dealing with two variables, which is the kind of problems we're doing, um, then the answer is just an ordered pair. If we were dealing with three variables, then the answer would be an ordered triple, because you would have to give me an x, a y, and a z. But we're only dealing with two, so you only have to give me a pair in the answer, an x and a y. And as we've already said, when you're trying to solve a system graphically, you are looking for where the graphs cross. Now the calculator is great, you can type it in, but when you want to type an equation in on the graphing calculator, what variable has to be by itself? Y. y. You have to have y by itself. So if you have a problem where y is already by itself, like this one, perfect. You just put one of them in y1, put one of them in y2. If you have a problem like this one, y is not by itself. We need to fix it first. So, what would you do first in the top equation to start to get y by itself? Tell me what you'd move to the other side. Yep. Subtract 2x from the left. Okay. So that would give you 3y equals negative 2x plus 5. And what would be my last step to get y by itself? Yep. Uh, divide everything by 3y. Yep. Uh, divide everything by what? Three. Just 3. Divide by 3, 3, and 3. There you go. There's your first one. y equals negative 2 thirds x plus 5 thirds. And what would we do in the bottom to get y by itself? Yep. You add 3x to each side. Add 3x. And then add the value side by 5. So I add the 3x, it becomes positive, and now divide by 5. And these are just two equations in the form y equals mx plus b. When you draw something that's y equals mx plus b, what shape is it? Is it a parabola? What does y equals mx plus b look like? It's a line. It's a line. So all we're doing is drawing two lines. Let's see what happens. Okay, so clear anything you got in there. Um, because our slopes are parentheses, are fractions, you're going to want to use parentheses. So let's do negative. 2 thirds x plus 5 thirds. Just like, just like that. Okay, so we got the top one. Hopefully you guys got the bottom one typed in. Uh, 3 fifths x plus 21 fifths. Okay, we'll do a zoom 6. Remember, you may have to zoom out to see, uh, see what's happening, but I think, uh, I think we're going to be fine. Okay, so they definitely cross. They could have been parallel if the slopes were the same, and then they wouldn't cross, then you wouldn't have an answer. 
This time they do. So second, calc, intersect. Does the yes matter on this intersect? No, because there's only one. The yes only matters if there's more than one. Okay, so there's our answer. A couple different ways we can write it. You can write it exactly like that. X equals negative 2, Y equals 3. Or you could write the answer negative 2, comma 3. And that's how you do an answer. Any questions on that? Okay, let's try one more, and then that'll be it for this set. Okay, uh, in this one, are they asking for the solution? No, what are they asking for here? Number of solutions. The number. They don't want to know what they are, they want to know how many there are. So just make sure you read it carefully. Because finding how many there are is a lot faster than finding what they are. So we got negative x cubed plus 3x squared plus x minus 3. And negative 2x squared plus 5. Let's do zoom 6. So remember, you're looking for where they cross. Okay, so looking at that, um, how many solutions do we have? Yep. Looks like two. Two? Okay. I think it's three. Why? Because um, the bottom of the parabola um, is not straight down, it's on an angle, so eventually if we keep zooming out at a certain point, we'll see that there's a third point that causes between the two. And so if we zoom out lower, you're going to see that that red and the blue line get closer and closer. I might not have zoomed out enough. Uh, let's see. Well, maybe not quite enough, but I've zoomed out enough that you can see there is going to be a third intersection point. It might be just off the screen now. So the answer here is three. If you put two, uh, you would get that one wrong. So what the point is, make sure you zoom out enough to see something that could be off the screen. If you can't, if you're not sure, just you know, zoom out a couple times. You know? So you don't have to set it in like millions to zoom out, but if you set it in like you know, 50 or 60 for your mins and maxes, that's usually zoomed out enough that you could see something that's off the screen. So the answer is questions on that. Alright, so what we're really spending most of today on is 4.1. Uh, there will be some homework from that last section. It'll be two problems. And then the rest of the homework will be from 4.1. So, chapter 3, we talked about polynomials. <coughs> Polynomial basically looks like... Uh, let's see if I had a quick example. Like this. This is a polynomial. 2x minus 13. It's not x squared or anything complicated. It's just 2x minus 13. This is another polynomial, x minus 5. When you take two polynomials, one in the top, one in the bottom, and you divide them, that is called a rational function. So a rational function is just when you divide two polynomials. So it says a rational function is a fraction where what's in the top and 
what's in the bottom are polynomials. So another example, x squared plus 3x minus 6 over x minus 4. That's another example of a rational function. Quadratic polynomial in the top, linear polynomial in the bottom. Now, what um, what are you never allowed to put in the bottom of a fraction? Zero. <coughs> so the polynomial in the bottom can't be zero. And that's true because you can never divide by zero. There's another example of a rational function. I'm not going to do anything with it right now. I'm just showing it to you. It's quadratic at the top, linear in the bottom. There's another one. This one is a quadratic over a quadratic. I mean, you don't have to write everything down for these examples, but those are just more examples. Now, what number did we just say you're not allowed to divide by? Zero. Zero. So what number would you not be allowed to use for x in this problem? Yeah. Three. Three. That's important. We have to be able to figure out the numbers you're not allowed to use. And they are the numbers that would cause you to divide by zero. So when we're talking about finding the numbers that you can use, that's called the domain. The domain is every number you can plug in that will not make the bottom zero. That's the only thing you don't want to do. You don't want to make the bottom zero. I think that's actually the one I just had on the board. So what number did we just say you can't use here? Three. So if you want to visualize your domain, think of it this way. You can't use three, but you can pick anything you want that's lower. That's fine. You can pick anything you want that's higher. So that graph in red represents anything you can pick. There's a hole at three because you can't use three. So the domain of this is really broken up into two parts. How would you describe part one? What's the lowest that the arrow on the left goes? Uh, infinity can't be a low value. <coughs> Infinity can be a high value. Negative. Negative infinity. And what's the highest that that arrow on the left goes? Yep. Three. Including it or not including it? Not including. So we put a parenthesis. Not including three. Or, now describe the arrow on the right. What's the lowest that arrow number two goes? Yep. Three. Including or not including? not including? Not including three. And what's the highest that that arrow goes? Yeah. Infinity. Infinity. That's how you describe the domain. Everything below the number three and everything above the number three, but not the number three. We use a bracket when you want to include a number. We use a parenthesis when you don't. Questions on that? So all we're really doing is something we spent a lot of time on this week. Finding the roots of an equation. Find the number that makes the denominator zero. And that's what you don't use. Now, let's look at this one. I don't really care what's in the numerator right now. All I care about is what's in the denominator. And I want to know what would make the denominator zero. What type of expression is in the denominator? Yeah? 
that's quadratic. We have to find out what numbers we could fill in to make the denominator zero. What's one way that we can solve a quadratic? Yeah? We could use the quadratic formula. What's another way? Yeah? We could try factor. So let's keep the top the same. And let's see if we can factor the bottom because that makes it easy to figure out the zeros. So we would need an x and an x. What about my signs? Plus, minuses, or one of each? Yeah, one of each. It's one of each. Two numbers that multiply to give me two, and they have to subtract to give me one. Yeah? Uh, the two goes with the positive sign, and the one goes with the negative. Let's check it. x squared minus x plus two is plus one. Perfect. That's exactly it. So now, Tell me the two numbers that you are not allowed to use in the domain, in for x here. What two numbers can you not use? And then we'll write it saying what you can use. It'll be everything except that. Yep? Negative 2 and negative 4. Right. You can't use negative 2 or positive 1. So think of that on a number line. Negative 2, 0, 1, 2. Negative 1, 0, 1, 2. You can't use negative 2. And you can't use positive 1. So this is a visual to just see, well, what can you use? You can use anything below there. You can use anything above there. Or you can use anything between there and there. So how many parts does this domain have? Yeah, three. It has three parts. Part one, part two, part three. How would you describe part one? The low value, the high value, and then would I use parentheses, brackets, how would I do it? Yep. Yeah. So the low value would be negative infinity. Yep. And then the Higher value would be negative 2, not including them. Perfect. That's part 1. How would you write part 2? Yep. Yeah. You would have parentheses. Yep. You would have your low value be negative 2. Yep. And your high value would be 1. 1. That's part 2. And how would you describe the third part of the domain? Yep. Yeah. You would have not including 1 uh, and then infinity. Infinity. And three parts is the most you would probably ever have. Two is pretty common, like we had in this one. Three is a little bit more rare, but you could have three. You won't have four. Okay. Any question on that one? So that's called finding the domain. So both of those problems I just gave you were rational functions. That's a rational function. That's a rational function. The simplest one is that one. That's what they consider to be the simplest rational function. You put a 1 in the top, you put an x in the bottom. And that rational function has a special name. It's called the reciprocal function. So that's the simplest one you can have. doesn't have any exponents. There's no adding, subtracting. There's no one in the top, x in the bottom. Okay, let's graph it. It's a lot easier to type in than one of those because there's no, there's no exponents. You just have to press three buttons. One divided by x. And let's, let's graph it. When you graph it, uh, you know what? Let's put it here. You're going to get a graph. Looks like that. A couple things I want to fix. The calculator didn't quite do that perfect. That graph shouldn't stop. It looks like it goes down and it just stops. It doesn't stop. 
just keeps going. And this one just keeps going up, getting closer and closer and closer to the axis as it goes up. Does it ever meet the axis? No. It will never, you know, it looks like it touches it, but that's just because the, the screen can only show so much detail. Those blue curves never touch any of those axes. And there's a name for that. So let's look at the graph again. And this is the graph of 1 over x. Now, just think of it from a point of view of numbers. Don't, don't even look at the graph. But as x gets bigger and bigger and bigger, the denominator in this fraction gets bigger and bigger and bigger. What happens to the whole fraction, though? As x continues to grow, the entire fraction, yeah? The fraction just keeps getting smaller and smaller. The fraction keeps getting smaller and smaller. And what is it getting closer and closer to? Yeah? Zero. It's getting closer and closer to zero. If x is 100, you have 1 over 100. It's small, but it's not zero. It's 0 0.01. If you have 1 over 1,000, it's even smaller. It's 0.001, 1 1,000, but it's not 0. How about if x is a million? Is 1 divided by a million 0? No. I don't care what you divide the number 1 by. It never will be 0. Even if you divide 1 by a billion, it's very small, but it is not 0. It never will reach 0. And the same thing happens as you go to the left. If you divide 1 by negative 10, you get negative 0.1. If you divide 1 by negative 1,000, you get negative 0 0.001. So what's happening on the left is it's getting closer and closer and closer to the x-axis, coming up from the bottom. On the right, it's getting closer and closer to the x-axis, coming down from the top. But in both directions, it's getting closer and closer and closer but never reaching the number zero. Any question on that? What if I made that number in top a five? What would this be getting closer and closer to now if x got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger? In your head, let x be 10. And let it be a hundred, let it be a thousand, let it be a million. I want to know what's happening to that fraction. Yeah? It's still getting closer and closer to zero. It's still getting closer and closer to zero. I mean, what's the difference if you take one over a million or five over a million? It's basically the same answer. It's very, 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 very small. So the number you have at the top here doesn't even matter. If you take a number that's fixed and you divide it by a number that's growing forever, it's going to get closer and closer to zero. Always. So, as x heads to the right, that's infinity. As x heads to the left, that's negative infinity. No matter which way you head on this graph, you're getting closer and closer to the number zero. This describes what we just said. f of x is the y value. Think of it like this. That's what we just graphed. As x grows, y shrinks. What does it shrink to? Zero. But because it never reaches zero, we say that zero is an asymptote. The line y equals zero is what we call an asymptote. And the way that we show an asymptote when we graph it is like this. Uh, I want to use my head. We usually show an asymptote as a dotted line. The dotted line represents something that you're continuing to get closer and closer and closer to, but you never reach it. Does anybody remember that word from? Uh, Algebra 2, like an asymptote. Whenever you write the equation of something horizontal in math, it always starts out y equals, and you put a number, 
y equals 2. In this case, it's not 2, it's y equals 0. And the way you find the horizontal asymptote in any problem is you look at the problem, you let the x get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Just pretend like x, x never stopped getting bigger. And I want to know what would happen to the expression as x continued to get bigger. Whenever you have an x in the bottom of a fraction, that part of it always turns into a zero. Just think about dividing a number by something bigger and bigger and bigger. It turns into zero. Um, so let's let people copy that first. So let's find the horizontal asymptote of this. So look at that problem. And first focus on the part with the x. I just want to know first what would happen to what's inside that red box as x continues to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. What would the number in this red box be getting closer and closer to? Zero. So this red box is getting closer and closer and closer to zero. And if you take a number that's extremely close to zero and you add two to it, what do you basically get? Yep, two. So this problem has a horizontal asymptote at two. Because as x gets bigger and bigger, this part in the red box doesn't even matter. Think of 1 divided by 100 billion. It's basically 0. And if I add 2 to it, I'm going to get basically 2. Now, it's horizontal, so what letter did I say we should always start with? Y. That's how you find your horizontal asymptote. Let's try another. Focus on the part that has an x in it first, and let x continue to get bigger and bigger and bigger in your head. And think about what happens to what's in that box. Then deal with what's outside the box. 1 over x. What happens to 1 over x as x gets bigger and bigger and bigger and never stops getting bigger? What happens to what's inside this box? gets smaller. What does it get close to? It gets very close to zero. If you take something that's close to zero and subtract three from it, what do you basically get? Negative three. So how would you write your horizontal asymptote? Y equals negative three. Thank you, Mr. Roy. Y equals negative three? Yeah. Well, I can do that. Yeah. This is, this is, right, this is right in my wheelhouse. Yep. Mold. You got this. Where's yeah, you got it. I can handle that. Yeah, I know you can. All right. Any questions on that? What if I made this one a twelve? What would the horizontal asymptote be now? It'd still be the same thing. If I take twelve and divide by a hundred billion, something huge, it's still close to zero. Doesn't matter. The y-intercept is basically indicated by that number right there. No, y, it's y horizontal aspect. All right. Now, let's look at the same graph we had again. But this time, I don't want to look what happens as I continue heading to the right. I already know that I approach zero. I want to look what happens as I close in on the center. So let's start in the part that's in the upper right. As I start to close in on the center, which the center is at zero, so what's happening to my graph as I start getting closer and closer and closer to zero? What happens to that curve in the upper right? 
it just keeps going up, but it'll never end up touching the zero. Right, it never ends up touching zero, and you said it just keeps going up. So if it keeps going up, what's it going up to? Infinity. Infinity. As you close in on the center, this graph curves up, and it never stops going up. Let's try the other side. So now let's start on the left and close in on the center from the left side. What happens to the graph as I close in on the center from the left side? Yeah? You just head towards negative infinity. I head towards negative infinity. So if you have a graph where as you head towards a point, all of a sudden one side curves up and one side curves down, that is another type of asymptote. What do you think we're going to call that kind of asymptote? Yeah? Vertical asymptote. That's a vertical asymptote. And that happens as a graph approach, approaches a value, it curves either up or down. Usually one side is up, one side is down. So this is how we explain the first part of what I said. As x approaches 0, the y value increases forever. That's what without bounding means. There's no limit. So as x gets close to 0, from the right, that's what positive sign means. From the right. And this is how you write it. This means as x is getting closer to 0, from the positive side. Because when you're coming at a number, there's two sides you can come at it from. The positive side or the negative side. So this means as x gets close to zero from the right, positives are on the right, the y value increases forever. This is the second thing we said. As x gets closer to zero from the left. That's what that little symbol means. That's a negative. Negatives are on the left. So as you approach zero, coming at it from the negative side, that means from the left side, the y value curved down. And it never stopped curving down. That type of behavior indicates a vertical asymptote. And in our problem, the vertical asymptote was at zero. The equation is written a little differently. It's not y equals. If you put y equals, what kind of asymptote are you writing? Yep. That's horizontal. If you put x equals, you are writing a vertical. So, how do you find the vertical asymptote? Well, go back and look at this graph again. The vertical asymptote was x equals 0. It's right on the y-axis. What number can you plug into the denominator? Or, I'm sorry, what number can you not plug into the denominator here? Yeah? Zero. zero. The numbers that you cannot put in the denominator are the vertical asymptotes. That's how you find them. So if you know how to find the domain, you already know how to do vertical asymptotes. Um, so this is what's important. As long as the numerator and the denominator do not have any common factors, you will get a vertical asymptote when the denominator is zero. So if you look at what I just wrote in red, when would the denominator be zero in that problem? Yeah. If x equals 4. If x equals 4. You will have a vertical asymptote at x equals 4. Now, let's say, let me write a different one down. x minus 2 times x plus 1 over x plus 1. 
I said one thing that was very important in there. I said something about having no common factors. This problem that I just wrote down, x minus 2 times x plus 1 over x plus 1, there is a common factor there. What's the common factor in this problem? Yeah? X plus 1. X plus 1. So normally you would say you can't use negative 1. And you're right, you can't. You can't use negative 1 because it would cause you to divide by 0. But you will not have a vertical asymptote at negative 1 because of this common factor. This common factor, it's like it cancels out the vertical asymptote. You still can't use negative 1. You just don't get a vertical asymptote. So any question on what I mean by common factor? Yep? Would that be considered like a whole one solution? Yes, exactly. That is called a whole. I wasn't really going to mention it, but yes. Nice job. It's a whole. We might have talked about it before. I don't remember. But if you were to graph that, you would never see that there's a hole in the graph. It's impossible to see. Okay, so very clear in this problem, there are no common factors between the top and the bottom, so you are going to get a vertical asymptote. Can anybody tell me um, what number we get a vertical asymptote at? Yeah? Two. Two. That's it. Vertical asymptote at x equals 2. How about now? Yeah? 2. Still 2. Making the top 15 doesn't change the number you plug into the bottom to get 0. So just focus on the bottom. How about this one? What's my vertical asymptote this time? Yeah? Negative 3. How about now? Negative 3. This negative 14 would have just changed something, but it didn't change the vertical asymptote. What did that what would that number change? Yeah? That would change your horizontal. But that has nothing to do with the vertical. Okay. Any question on Uh, we're going to skip the graph on that one. I think we're... Okay, um, you know what? I'm not going to worry. I don't think about this one. Um, what I do want to do is rewrite it for you real quick and then do this problem. So, the issue here is it's not written with a number in the top. You always want to have a 1 in the top. I'm going to fix it for you so there's a 1 in the top. And the way I'm going to fix it is I'm just going to divide this out. Okay, I already have that done for you on the test. But I'm going to quickly divide this out with synthetic division. It's going to take me 20 seconds. Get that done. So let me put 5, 2, negative 13. Uh, bring down my 2. 5 times 2 is 10. Negative 13 uh, plus 10 is negative 3. Okay, so I can write it as quotient plus remainder over divisor. So let me just fix this, and then we'll do the problem. So my quotient is 2x. Uh, no, just 2. Sorry, not even an x, because there's only... That's my remainder. So my quotient is 2. My remainder is actually a minus this time. And my original divisor was x minus 5. Okay, let me clean that up a little bit. Let's put the 2 on the end, because when we write something, we usually put the number we're adding on the end. And let me fix it so there's a 1 in the top. Okay, 
So now I want you guys to work with that. That's a lot easier to see the horizontal asymptote, vertical asymptote, and the transformations. So I would have that part already done for you. But all I did was divide it. That's all I did. We got that. So each one of these numbers is going to do something. When you add or subtract inside the fraction, it's a shift. Does anybody remember what kind of shift? Is it the horizontal or the vertical? Horizontal. It's always the horizontal. The horizontal is the one that's inside the thing, in this case, inside the fractions. That number is a horizontal shift. Now, that's adding or subtracting outside the fraction. It's still a shift, but what kind of number do you think, what kind of shift do you think the plus two is going to be? Hmm? Um, is it going to be a vertical shift? That's going to be a vertical shift. Now, this is multiplying by a number. It's outside the fraction. When I say outside, I mean it's not in the bottom. It's outside. Because it's outside, it's going to be vertical, but it's not a shift, it's multiplication. When you multiply, what kind of transformation do you have? It's not a shift, it's a stretch. It's a stretch. And we've talked about this a couple times. When you put a negative in front of a number, what does that cause your graph to do? Yeah? Right, this is what we call a vertical reflection because it's with the vertical number. A vertical reflection would look like this. Um, that's a vertical reflection, flipping up to down. Okay, so vertical reflection. So I kind of pointed it out, but how many transformations are happening in this problem? Yeah? Four. Okay. Always do that one first. We don't have a number here in this problem. I'll put an imaginary box there. That would be a stretch, but it would be horizontal. We don't have that in this problem, so we don't, we don't have to worry about it. If we did, though, that would be the second one. But we're going to skip it for this problem. The vertical stretch is the third one, the reflection is the fourth one, and the shift is the fifth one. That's the order you follow when you do transformations. Okay, so let's write them down. The five is going to shift it which way? You have to tell me more than it's a horizontal shift. Is it left or right? Yep. Uh, minus is going to go right. Yep. The second one is we don't have the stretch, so let's go to. Hi. Bye. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, this one is a vertical stretch. Does anybody remember how you say it? Vertical stretch by. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Vertical stretch by factor. Of three. Okay, uh, this one is really nothing else to say. It's a vertical reflection. And the last one, you got to be a little more specific. Vertical shift. Which way? Yep. Three units up. Yep. So shift up two. There's your transformations, and there's your diagram that explains. Okay. Horizontal asymptote always starts out with one letter. Y. Y. Vertical starts out with one letter. Yep. Okay, so at least we get that. What number would make the denominator zero? There you go. There's your vertical. And think about, I'll just put a big box around that. 
Think about what happens as X gets bigger and bigger and bigger. What happens to what's inside that black box? Gets smaller. And what does it approach? It approaches zero. If you take something close to zero and multiply it by negative three, what do you get? Yeah? Still something that's close to zero. If you take one and you divide by 25 million, it's going to be so small, multiplying it by negative three isn't even going to matter. It's still close to zero. And if you take something close to zero and add two? Yep. Something very close to two. And we call something very close an asymptote. So that's your horizontal asymptote. Question on it? Yes. Well, what happens if you have one, but it doesn't have like a plus two? Uh, if it didn't have a plus two, then the horizontal asymptote would have been zero. Okay. Yep, would have been zero. <coughs> would you see it on the graph hit zero? Yeah, uh, you'd see it just like this one. That has a horizontal okay. asymptote at zero. Okay. When it's zero, it's the axis. Okay. Uh, all right, so this is the last one. Took a little longer on that other one than I thought we would, but that's okay. So we're going to look uh, for the last one at a mixture problem. We've done mixture problems before. Mixture problems we did before were harder. They involved a system. This is going to be simple. If I told you that you have 50 ounces of liquid sitting in front of you, and I said to you, out of that 50 ounces sitting in front of you, 35% of it has acid in it. How would you figure out how much of it is acid? I'm telling you, you've got 50 ounces, and 35% of what you have is acid. So tell me how much acid you have. Yeah? You want me to tell you how to do it? Yeah. So you just multiply 50 by 0 0.35. Right. So in that particular case, if you have 50 ounces of liquid and somebody tells you 35% of it is actually acid, maybe the rest of it's water, that means you have 17.5 ounces of pure acid. What is the rest of it? I don't know. It's just something else. But you just multiply how much you have times the percentage. It's like if I said to you, there were 50 questions on a test and you got 35% of them right. <coughs> How many questions did you get right? 17 and a half right. Okay. Same idea. So that's a big part of understanding our, our question. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to take that same solution, 50 ounces, and we're going to put, we're going to pour 100% pure acid into this mixture. Now think about if you have something that is a mixture of water and acid, and you keep pouring acid into it, will it ever be 100% acid? No. It always had some water in it. That part that's water might get smaller and smaller and smaller, but it's never going to be pure acid. It's like if you had white paint and you put a drop of black in it. I don't care how much more white paint you keep pouring in. There's still black in that paint. It might be sm so small you can't even see it, but it's still it's still in there. You can't take that back out once you mix it in. Okay. So what we're going to want to do is write a formula for the new concentration after we put this many ounces of acid into our mixture. And the formula for concentration is pretty simple. The top is the amount of acid, and the bottom is the total. So if you said you had 70 ounces of acid, and I had 100 liters total, 70 out of 100, that means it's 70%. So let's figure that out with, with our problem. We have two sources of acid in this mixture. First of all, we're starting with a mixture that already has acid in it. If we have 50 ounces 
and 35% of it is acid, how much acid is already in it? Yeah? We already have 17.5. Plus, how many ounces of pure acid are we pouring in? We're pouring in X more. Now, let's write the total. How much liquid did we have in front of us when we started this? Before we get in, we had how much? 50 ounces. 50 ounces. And how much liquid did we add? X. We added X. So what did you get? 50 times 0.35. 50 times 0.35. Oh, okay. And that's the formula for the concentration. Concentration is always between 0 and 1. 0 represents nothing. 1 represents 100% pure solution. 0.6 would be 60%. It always comes out between 0 and 1. So, if I said to you that I wanted to get a mixture that is 75% acid. What's 75% as a decimal? Yeah? 0.75. If I put that Y1, I would get a line that looks like that. If I put that in Y2, I would get something that looks like that it would start to level off as it gets close to 1 because it can never reach 100% pure acid because there was always water in it. So I'd have a line and I'd have a curve. And if I wanted to know where these two things are equal, what do you think I would have to find between the line and the curve? Yeah? The intersect. You'd find the intersect. So you just don't have enough time to do the intersect. But I can do one tomorrow if you don't remember how to do an intersect. And that, that's it. So we put the formula, are we doing the one for this, or are we doing the test? So, yeah. Homework, that's the take home. It's part one. And that's going to be due at 8 a.m. tomorrow. It will be on Edge Elastic. We'll do part two of the test in class tomorrow. Part two in class. How many questions will be on? I think part two is probably going to be like six questions, maybe. Six or seven. And part one is like six or seven. Okay. If you have any questions or you don't feel you can do it as a take home because you don't have internet, you don't have a Chromebook that's going to work, uh, you have to work. If you can't do it, let me know. Is there anybody that is going to choose not to do it as a take home and figure out something else? Okay. This will open at 2.40, and I will give you one hour to do the six questions. You'll have one hour, you'll have 60 minutes to do six questions.